folks. Welcome back to Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast featuring distinctly qualified global change makers that are dedicated to creating a healthier planet, one where diversity is lived, expressed and celebrated. My name is Julian Guderlei. I am committed to a world that allows people from all walks of life to thrive. And today's episode is part of the Design Science Studio series, a collaboration with the Buckminster Fuller Institute. And my guest is Lawrence Curry-Clark. Lawrence is a philosopher, an artist, an infinite game designer, seeking the path to utopia. In other words, he's a meta-modern game designer. So welcome, Lawrence. Thank you for having me, Julian. I'm excited about this, this conversation with you around, you know, maybe a, a, a touch of philosophy and then also what, um, what I just phrased as meta-modern game design. And maybe you want to want to start there and just unpack this for people um, who are new to the term um, and, and how it comes that this is like your passion in, in kind of world building. Meta-modern game design refers to the increasing scope of the realm of play that we live in and designing games that give us more and more agency over all of the various dimensions of our lives. So over the last centuries, as we've had increasing amounts of leisure, we've had access to more and more possibilities of play. And as our self-understanding has increased, we're starting to learn how to play with the inner dimensions as well as the outer dimensions. So what metamodern game design does is it attempts to design games that allows as many different people as possible to play in as many different ways along as, as many different dimensions, be they inner and be they outer. So what does that mean concretely? It means games that have clear developmental lines, so you can see how you gain those experience points, along things like your inner awareness of learning to play with attention, of learning to cultivate your attention so you have more and more play in the sense of like with a spanner has play on a nut that you have access to a wider range of movement with that and also the outer dimensions so for example learning to organize oneself and with others to interface with the world in a way which gives us more sovereignty over it. So in the history of culture, there was a big shift with the development of democracy, where people first had the opportunity to play in the arena of politics. And now with the development of the internet, there's a whole range of new possibilities which are opening up. Yeah, this is exciting. I, I, I love your, you know, um, how you're taking us down this, this rabbit hole uh, of, you know, what you call meta modern and, and participatory um, kind of, uh, you know, d d design. And, 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 and again, I want to come back to the term of world building, right? Because really, we're, we're not here to be kind of robotic, uh, slave like participants in a game that was set up for us, but we're here to actually um, become our own game as, as you kind of said from the inside out. And as we're doing this, we're changing the outer, the outer world. And, and so it, it starts on the inside and how we interface with who we are, who we truly are. Why am I even here? What am I even doing on this planet? And, you know, it could be called even spiritual from that perspective, but, but really it's quite existential in that sense too. And then it, it is the world we're increasingly going into as a world of infinite possibilities, which is quite visible through the internet or the future of the internet, as long as it stays accessible to all, I guess. I think this is really present for me that there is um, kind of like a tentacle of, of all control systems that is, is like, hey, what about us? What about if we just keep controlling it for everyone? 
how do you see this bridge into what you just coined as self-sovereign, um, you know, humans and individuals um, just, just taking over and building this new world? It begins with attention, with the, the trim tab, as Buckminster Fuller likes to call it, that you have over the direction of Spaceship Earth. So what Buckminster Fuller means by that is the trim tab is a rudder on a rudder, which allows you to make micro corrections that have a, a big impact on the direction of the boat. And this is the, the fundamental interface that we have with the world. So that needs to be cultivated from the youngest age to the highest possible uh, levels of capability. But also that attention needs to be protected inside of a vessel. And what we're currently experiencing is the accumulation of compound intergenerational trauma, which is starting to hit a peak point where all of our vessels are so fractured from, from the very get-go, from those very first breaths that we take as we enter into the world, that we can't uh, build up the attention to interface with the world. We can't contain it long enough. There's always a crack when something triggers us and it, it seeps out. And again, we lose our sovereignty. Yeah, you described this beautifully. Um, and in, in some ways, we, we can call this reconciling, right, that what, what has been before us, so that we're in awareness of the, 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 the ancestral lineage on a personal level, on a collective level. And as you said, the trauma and the pain that is still very present on the planet. But at the same time, we're, we're, as we're paying attention to this and letting it arise truly, I'm of the belief, and I've explored this in the podcast several times before, that um, the way we reconcile this trauma is, is highly personal as well. So it doesn't have to be the same topic of, of ancestral history for every individual, because we all have different kind of epigenetic markers that connect us to our own lineage of the past. However, what's really apparent to me in this journey on my, on my own kind of, um, uh, you know, trajectory is it only is so useful to hang out in the past. So it, it, it needs to come to our awareness and presence. Otherwise, we're actually just a victim to this kind of cycle, right? And we can't really interface with what's real and present. But then at some point, we want to really also dare and leap and, and kind of become the ancestors of the future. Because if we miss that jump forward, we're actually just repeating the patterns of what has been before us. Very much so. There's a moment where we stop the wheel and we begin the process of regeneration. And then we start pushing the wheel into a new spin. And rather than following along the same axis, during that moment of pause, we've realigned the spine, we've realigned the axis mundi, and then we can start re-spinning the wheel into a truer, into a more beautiful motion, the, that circulation of the spirit. And that is what the regenerative movement is all about. It's about taking those moments that, that we need to metabolize all of this accumulated past and this increasing complexification of the present moment learning how to digest all of that and then being able to see into the future and read what the future is telling us what it's calling us how to act i like that you're bringing it up into this kind of terminology that has been so active and alive in the the design science studio cohort you know it's we're, we're framing it and naming it as the regenesance and this is really what um i know you've explored before and the, my, my podcast has explored this already in many ways uh, as well but it comes back to 
the regenerative principle, the regenerative principle of life. That regenerative principle of life, it's, it's real. Humans haven't made it up. We're just learning to reharmonize with it in a way that everything that isn't real, that we've created as a kind of an illusionary template of the mind can kind of melt away. And we let that influence and that indoctrination melt away. And so as we're reharmonizing to this regenerative principle of life, you know, it, it's kind of curious to me because you, you said, I believe it was integrate or, or, or a word like that that triggered it, it to me uh, for me. There's a death process involved in it. And in the, in, in the ecology, that's what the mycelium, that's what the world of mushrooms, fungi, and bacteria is really there for. There is a, a continuous kind of infinite loop, like an infinite eight between the death and the life cycle that isn't... Um, it, it hasn't really a lot to do with the survival of the fittest. It's much more just this, the larger cycle of life that when we pause long enough, it just becomes visible and we are a part of it rather than here to dominate or control it. Which for me, that's where the, re the, the Renaissance part begins is when we observe this long enough, now we're able to, to kind of, um, you know, through art, through design, through um, philosophy, through, through, through creative writing, through um, technology even, um, we're now able to add our kind of human, um, uh, yeah, ability or creativity into that mix of, of, of the cycle of life, rather than trying to pin down life, right, dominating it to the point where we're, as you said a little earlier, we're just going to recreate the cycle of trauma. And so I'm curious for, for how you see this regenerative principle of life and or, or how this has become so plainly obvious to you that, um, you know, I think for a lot of people listening, th these are, this is, this is real, but then there's this like this kind of back and forth doubting between what I just named, like this is what's naturally there on an organic planet. And then there's this template we've laid on top of it as humans. And so in this phase we're in right now, um, with reconciliation and recommitting to what's what's coming or what we want to build. Yeah, I believe it's it's a lot about literally letting go of this old template and just continuing to reconcile and move forward, reconcile and move forward. How does this process look for you? Well, we need to learn how to die individually and collectively. We need to learn how to let go, uh, to let the old order die so a new one may be born. And right now we're holding on so tightly to life that we're crushing it. Whereas the optimum grip is just a very delicate you're holding on to the golden thread as it's passing through your fingers and it, it's singing in between your fingers and it's playing a harmony and that's it, no more. And then there's a moment when your thread comes to an end and the next one begins. But right now what we have is people who have lived hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, are still holding on with as much force as they can to the world. They're clinging to their empire and we're still living inside of that world. And until we can stop and let the old order decay, and return into that mycelial zone and then be reborn, we're always going to be reproducing the same thing. That, that, is, that was deep. That was beautiful. I'm, I'm letting it sink in. And what I'm kind of feeling arise is as, as this decay process is happening, groups like the design science studio and, and many others like this are are kind of gathering to understand okay we're in this process between hospicing to dead 
uh, to death the the old system letting that decay so that mycelial intelligence can take over and on the other side we're we're like midwifing um to to life something that we don't even necessarily know um it, it you know maybe utopia uh, or paradise are, are great terms for it uh, even though they might trigger some people but we just know we're committed to it we just know we're wildly committed to it we don't even have to know all the pathways there but as we're standing in this wild commitment i think this this stance between those two realms and worlds is becoming more apparent and more apparent and more apparent and in the interpersonal space um and this is what's shown up for for me and you know often I also as an observer sometimes as a participant in those eight months of the design sense studio in our internal meetings um and for anyone who's, who's curious definitely apply there's there's lots of gold in those kind of meetings what was arising is this this active process of reconciliation this active process of composting the old the old ways of thinking the old ways of listening the old ways of talking and you know it can be really challenging <laughs> and it's that's kind of the point of it is to to build the capacity of resilience because the more resilient we are, the less afraid we are, the, 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 the less tight our grip needs to be, right? And so if our grip isn't as tight, now suddenly we can let flow what life wants to inform us with. And, and like, that's why this is an artistic incubator and, and a de developmental art incubator, because any painter, any musician, any poet, any writer knows this feeling you can't control this creative force, but you practice until you're comfortable in the uncomfortable of kind of leaning into this expressive state where it just kind of flows through you. Collective bodies like the Design Science Studio are the coming together, the coalescing of new forms of social organs social organs within which accelerated metabolic processes can take place. So what the Design Science Studio is attempting to do is to rapidly accelerate cultural change by taking on an enzymotic role. So what does that mean? It means to be like a mimetic enzyme an enzyme is a protein chain which rapidly accelerates a chemical transformation. So people often talk of catalysts. Catalysts allow to accelerate a chemical transformation hundreds of times, thousands of times. But an enzyme allows to accelerate a chemical process billions of times. And without enzymes, the whole inner world would be running far too slow for life to exist. Like to gain that attunement to the present moment, to, to come into that presence and the fundamental biological presence. What the Design Science Studio is trying to do with this organization of many different mimetic processes is to create these chains of enzymes that allows to metabolize the culture as a whole faster and faster, faster and faster, so that we can catch up with this complexity, which is flooding us right now. Yeah, that was a great metaphor. It's th this mimetic process of, of enzymes or, you know, like the, the, the difference between catalysts and enzymes is it's it's very interesting because it's it's biological and it brings us back to this is a regenerative principle not of our minds we didn't make this up this is just ecology and what we can observe and so it you know if you follow this with kind of a an aligned head heart hara axis on your inside and just a very logical mind. It just makes so much sense that these biological processes are also active as um, within our species, not just within our bodies, not just within the, the external natural world, but the way we gather, the way we communicate, the way we sense make. 
is also underlying kind of a, a, a biological pattern. And so there's to a degree we're experiencing it and we're realizing it, and this is joyful and exciting. But then to a degree, it's it's also just plain observable because it's happening all around us in the world of nature. Just like, you know, um, when you see a tree without leaves and you look at the, or even with leaves, if you look at the structure of, of branches and, and, and twigs and um, coming, going away from, from, from the trunk, kind of resembles how our lungs look like or how parts of our uh, inner body looks like, right? And so everything is truly interconnected. This is not a kind of esoteric um, desire, but it's a, a plainly visible fact of ecology. I love how you just expressed this. There was a moment in the 19th century where there was a bifurcation point of how we understand sociology. So there were certain sociologists who were trying to understand the society as a collective body, so applying a biological metaphor. And then there were others who were influenced by the industrial technology, which was emerging and then applying a mechanistic understanding. And that is where something fundamental was lost, is that the, the right way to see society, or, or at least one of the fundamental lenses through which we need to see society, is the biological and the proto-biological. So it, it isn't necessarily that societies are organisms or superorganisms, although they may be on their way. It's that they already have characteristics of proto-life forms. And now that we're starting to understand more and more this principle of living systems and how it applies to all levels of the world, we're starting to see that it applies to our inner worlds as well as our outer worlds. And it applies to the ways that we interface with the world, be it ourselves with our bodies, ourselves with each other, ourselves with the collective consciousness, or ourselves with the cosmos. Yeah, beautifully said. I'd love to, you know, um, come back in from the cosmos all the way to the design science studio and this cohort one and this idea that this um this developmental art incubator that is committed wildly committed to a world that will works for all is not just a program it's a decade-long experience and in my um personal kind of metaphor world it's almost like it's a magnet to attract the 2000 participants who can hold this frequency and want to play in it. And from there, 2000 people will inevitably impact dozens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people through the art, the communication, uh, the, the games, the, the worlds they are building. What is it through your lens? What is the, you know, the, you know we, we mentioned Buckminster Fuller and the Buckminster Fuller Institute kind of as the backdrop that's hosting the, the Science Science Studio. Um, especially in context to like this longer time frame, which is not necessarily usual to a lot of the programs out there. Full stack civilization design. How do we redesign everything from the tiniest interactions in between people into the whole architecture of our civilization and also this new world which is emerging this liminal zone of the world beyond the city uh, a return to uh, not a simpler but a more simplex form of life uh, which allows us to step outside of the overwhelming complexity and super stimuli of the cities an interface with them in this in this liminal space and the the key as i see it are the chains it's the chain reaction and it's how is the design science studio going to 
generate interplay between the various participants within one cohort and interplay between the different cohorts and how is momentum going to build up more and more until by the end of this decade we can celebrate with a new monument. Yeah, I like that bit about the interplay between the cohorts, because as you and I have been part of cohort one, this is something that we're kind of excitingly looking forward to. Meanwhile, somebody listening right now to this episode, and we don't know when you're listening to this episode, this might be a month after we recorded it or six years after we recorded it, might join this, you know, from the perspective of our future six, eight years further and still be in this interface space with us which is kind of one of these, these genius um, elements to it from where I'm watching what is happening, that it, it transcends time and that allows us to understand we're not really doing this in 2021. I mean, we are from one side of looking at it, but really we're, we're from the future, feeling, knowing, understanding what the future looks like maybe some of us visually, maybe some of us from an, uh, a felt inclusive and um, a kind of equity equality perspective, maybe some of us from, from just the perspective of presence. And so as we're from this future, we're creating from this future. And this is actually how I've experienced my entire life so far. And I'm you know, born in 87, I'm 33 this year. It's like trying to understand where this can touch the ground in any given moment or any given year that I'm walking on this earth, this kind of more multidimensional cosmic insight that so many of us have. And just in the recent decade, this became fashionable to talk about or, or, or become, became more normalized. And so this is what is exciting for me to understand that there is this, this process that's being activated that is alive and living across time completely outside of the linear timeline and at the same time there is also a linear timeline happening but that's just kind of how it always does mm. we're always interfacing with the future and as our media gains potency we're interfacing with more and more precision and uh, more and more impact. A hundred years ago, you could read a book that somebody had written about their experiences of traveling to the jungle. Now you can live stream that experience and you can participate in that experience by having that person interfacing with you in real time. And all of this information is being recorded and the fidelity is increasing over time and the quantity is increasing over time. So the future has access to more and more of the present, more than has ever existed in the past. Now, how is the future going to metabolize all of that information? The, the, the flood is just going to continue to rise, continue to rise, continue to rise. And there's going to be the, the requirement for the development of a new kind of human, one which can return to the roots, can regain those fundamental roots, be so rooted in deep time while simultaneously being more and more cognitively complex, emotionally complex, more and more flexible to adapt to a world which is going to become more and more chaotic and learning how to metabolize that chaos into order, into cosmos. So I say good luck to you in the future. 
of it. Um, <laughs> that's amazing. You you mentioned something really really curious there at the kind of beginning of 2021. We're we're witnessing on the technology side of things. You know, we're still interfacing with these little smartphones, and we're witnessing a transition from kind of um, a medium that seemed very participatory, like the social media platforms like Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, to a a faster speed that is much more participatory much more inclusive and much more real time. That's the word you used. Um, namely, for example, the, the platform Clubhouse uh, experiencing a, a rise before it's even like available to everyone. It's, it's, it's like incredibly trendy right now. And there is that shadow side of it being trendy and a cool kids club. But at the same time, when you're in one of those spaces, what is becoming apparent is that when humans have access to each other in real time, everything changes. Now, if we were to go back a thousand years and I'm a, um, you know, a bishop or a king of any kind of uh, area, I am controlling all of the uh, media and information flow that everyone else will hear. And I already control this before they will even hear it. So I can sit and reflect on all the possible pathways, like a chess game of what are they going to react to? How are they, how's the human psychology going to react to this? And as we've gone through time, this, this, this way of, of propaganda has kind of only increased speed, right? And it's at a certain kind of influx and turnaround point, and I think we've, we've crossed this now, this has become increasingly more obvious to a group of people. And so incoming is the timeline of the real, the real-time communication where, you know, I'll give you another uh, kind of parallel example. Um, careful trigger warning um <laughs> you might be sitting in a german living room aka my parents and watching the german news about the big virus and how it is impacting brazil and how devastating it is to all the people in brazil and how you're watching the news and there is images from the streets of brazil but then at the same time, five minutes later, your son, aka me, could call you via a fluid cell phone, a FaceTime or a Skype, and you have a real-time picture of what's actually happening in Brazil in a specific or a location, of course, of the country, not all of the locations. And suddenly your, your reality started to collide where it's like, well, wait a second. I just saw this devastating picture that was portrayed to me about something that is, can only be seen this one way. And now I'm seeing this other way that looks so different, that feels so different. Every window into this reality. And, and what's changed is, is, is instead of kind of, um, you know, uh, regurgitating the same media messages, which is, again, kind of increasingly becoming more obvious, we start to see things in real time. And I'd love for you to kind of, um, you know, whatever comes up for you there, Lawrence, but to, to touch on this interfacing in real time a bit more, because I think there is a, a clear turnaround point in our perception and, and reality creation. There once was a time when the control of communication happened at this slow rate, as you described, at the sending of a letter sealed with a paper ball, that only once it achieved its destination would create this huge explosion of transformation. And all of the time in between, it was as if nothing had changed. But the future had already been written from the moment that the seal was stamped and the message was sent. Now that's happening at a faster and faster speed. Now that's happening with supercomputers who are sending millions of messages all simultaneously, all at war with each other. And these supercomputers are in control of the economy. So the way that the stock exchange works, it, it works on the level of you're trying to get your server as close as possible to the stock exchange because that microsecond of a, of a difference can change everything. That's the rate at which the supercomputers are competing. And then the same thing uh, 
is happening in terms of interstate analytics and geo geopolitical analysis uh, predicting potential futures. So there there's an acceleration which is even beyond human time. There it's accelerating more and more and it's getting into the quantum as quantum computers are going to arise. We have the sensation that we're starting to catch up with this real time interfacing like what we're doing right now. But we are actually decades, centuries, millennia behind in a sense, because these supercomputers are so far ahead of us already. And they're going to get more and more ahead of us faster and faster. So yes, it's fundamental that we develop ways of interfacing over the internet uh, globally in a way that allows us to see the invisible, to connect with the other, even though that they're hundreds of miles, thousands of miles away, so that we can then act in a way in our lives where everybody is taken into consideration. But also, we need to gain sovereignty over the computational infrastructure of the world. Because as long as that remains in the hands of uh, the neo barons and the neo popes and the neo monarchs, then we're always going to be in that zone of lag where the seal of letter has already been sent and we're continuing as if everything was normal, but actually everything has already changed. Well said that that bit of self sovereignty and, and, you know, evolving into that space is really the pivotal experience of, of the beginning of this renaissance is understand deeply understand this and then um, bringing that into embodiment. This is kind of what I tried to say earlier from like the, uh, you know, uh, multidimensionality of our internal world. And, and yet we're here in this body on the planet. And so as we're bringing things here into the body on the planet, we're changing the way we are self-sovereignly or not uh, interacting, interfacing with people, with governments, with um, computing. And so, you know, you could kind of draw the metaphor of if you scroll down to click accept cookies or accept AGB because you want to see the website, it's, it's somewhat embodied, but it's mostly still in the head. But the moment this goes a little step further and if something enters your physical body or, you know, God forbid, we're, we're believing that humans are better with microchips than they are as the organic form that they are, it's changing entirely the way we are um, interacting and interfacing. And, you know, the, the way our consciousness is self-sovereign or our consciousness is is kind of uh, led and guided by um, whoever might be sending this letter with the, the golden seal on it, right? And so this is the time we're in right now is, is this choice point, I believe, this choice point um, between those, those timelines, those worlds where we either collectively arise as world builders in full trust and in full swing with the absolute chaos and beautiful harmony that can arise in the human through the human soul, the human spirit, the human creativity, or where we just continue um, the, the cycles of trauma to come back in a full circle to where we started of suppression, of, of colonialism, of um, controlling and gripping too hard onto this pulse of life. Right now, what's becoming aware for me is maybe someone's listening to this eight years from now, ready to sign up for the Sign Science Studio Core 10. And it's like, what are these guys talking about? All this is so long ago. Um, <laughs> but Lawrence, on that note, um, 
this has already been a fascinating conversation. And as we're, you know, kind of coming to the end part of it, I would love to, um, I'd love to hear maybe a word or two about who you think this Design Science Studio cohort or, or enzyme building protein packaging compound of uh, humans meeting is, is you think this is, a, is, is right for and just kind of speak an invitation to people that are listening. A world builders, um, playground designers, um, player developers, all the different facets of this new game that we're, we're, we're building the game board as we're playing it, we're carving the pieces with every breath and we're figuring out the rules as, as we follow various lines and see where they lead us. And we need you. We need you to come together and come and play together in a place where you can experiment, where you can collaborate with so many different people from so many different perspectives and help that collective spirit circulate and help build up that new stack that we need to realign our collective spine. You heard it, if that's you. Um apply or send it to a friend who, you know, is, is, is right on that space of resonance. I have one more question for you, Lawrence, and that is around the stewardship for the future, the seven generational perspective that we can choose to have on life. And in other words, if we were to zoom out for, let's say seven generations into the future, what's the, the dream, the, the earth vision, um, the prayer that you're holding for that future, for those future generations, for yourself, for our species, for our planet. Peace. Beautiful. May it be so. Thank you so much for your time and can't wait to share this episode with the world. Thank you, Julian.